Its original name, as we call it, is the Schwer Panzerjäger Alf Panther 1. So it's using the Panther 1 chassis. The Jag Panther story started way back in 1942. The Germans, especially Krupp, uh, the company Krupp, wanted to make a heavy Panzer Jäger mounted with the Pack 43 gun. So the first designs in about April of 42 looked a little bit similar to what we see in the Hetzer uh, in design shape. So they did actually build a wooden mock-up back in April of 42. From there, they progressed uh, from about uh, August of 42. It was agreed upon that the Panther chassis, the Panther 1 chassis, would be used in the Panzer Jaeger development or the heavy Panzer Jaeger development. So from there, designs got approved and we had another wooden mock-up made and presented to Hitler on the 20th of October 1943. The Jag Panther went into development and the first one was shown in uh, early December of 1943 and they went into production from about January of 1944. Three different companies made uh, the Jag Panther, so MyAg, uh, MNH and uh, MBA made these. If you look at the numbers, MyAg made about 270, uh, MNH made about 112 and MBA made about 37. There is a discrepancy in the numbers of, of four. Uh, but in that, there was uh, at least three prototypes made, so there's only that one that I can't account for at the moment. Our vehicle here is G2 essentially, but we're going to what G1 would have looked like. So the collar that we have just here was a lot smaller on the G1 and it was welded. Uh, from G2, we saw the bolt-on uh, collar here with mantlet, coupled with the gun, the Pack 43, three was uh, on the early Jag Panther. So this was a single piece monoblock gun. When we start going into G2, we see the Pack 43 4 variant. So this gun was a two piece gun. So we had the outer and then we had a liner on the inside. Now the liner gives you greater use of the gun as in the amount of rounds that we can fire. The Flak 36 went to a liner as well, a, uh, a three-piece liner. So we, again, we had the outer, uh, we had the two pieces uh, inside, um, and then there was uh, another couple of pieces that locked the liner in at each end. So we went from being able to fire 900 rounds on the, uh, the Flak 36 up to over 6,000 rounds, uh, and in some cases up to 10,000 rounds just by using a liner. So the introduction of the liner on the Pack 43-4 was actually a very good idea. Also with G1, if we look at the driver's uh, episcopes, we essentially had two to start off with. When we went to G2, we dropped one uh, episcope and went to one. The difference, especially on the back deck as we look at it, we can see the four intake air grills. Uh, they're quite large. And if we look at uh, this one here, which is G2, so this is using the Panther G back deck. So the air intake grills are quite small as well. So this part here is our crew compartment heater. The left hand fan drive, which is above the left hand radiators, we can actually put it in reverse drive. So instead of sucking air in, we can bring air up. We have some uh, covers here, six covers that would sit on top of the, the fan uh, cover here. Air would be sucked up through the, the radiators, warm air, in through two ducts that are under here, and then they would be fed via two pipes. Uh, into the fighting compartment and one would go to the driver and the other one would go to the radio operator. And these started to be fitted uh, on Panthers and Jag Panthers uh, from about October 1944. Very minor change uh, from here. We can see this mount here. If we have a look on the Panther A, we've got the antenna mount. So I've just moved that uh, up to the, uh, the back of the, uh, the case made. When they first showed the first prototype, the actual Travis left and right was 11 degrees either side. When it went into production, come out with 12 degrees uh, either side. So it had a fa fairly good uh, arc of shooting. Now to keep the vehicle as low as possible, when they looked at the depression and elevation, they started off with wanting negative 10 degrees in, in depression and up to 14 in elevation. But to keep it, especially with a higher uh, ground clearance, they reduced that to negative eight degrees uh, in depression and still kept it at about 14 in elevation. The, the sights, because they're periscopic, they actually come through the roof here, uh, and this whole uh, sliding part here, uh, the sight can actually follow the gun. 
This has a close-in uh, defence weapon. It's essentially a grenade launcher, or we can fire smoke as well. So this can traverse 360 degrees. It's at a 50 degree angle. So we can fire a uh, smoke grenade, uh, or we can fire a 28 mil grenade uh, anywhere between seven to 10 metres anywhere around the vehicle. And this grenade is uh, air burst. So it'll go off anywhere between half a metre to about uh, two metres off the ground. We've moved a lot of our tooling uh, that was originally uh, on the side to the back of the vehicle, because uh, there was some reports from uh, the, one of the first Panzer Jaeger units, the heavy Panzer Jaeger units, that uh, a lot of their tooling was uh, either getting damaged or ripped off. So they've redesigned it and put them on the back. We also have the Flam Venictors. So these are essentially a component that stops a lot of uh, sparks and flame coming out of the exhaust. So with a big V12 petrol engine, you have a lot of backfiring as well. So you get a lot of sparks and flame coming out of the exhaust. Now, if you're sitting in an ambush position with your vehicle running, your engine's running, there is that possibility to have flame come out of your exhaust and that's a way to give away your position. I'm a very key component for an armored vehicle. So as we know, these uh, plates were new old stock that were found in a, an old factory uh, near Berlin. Upper is still 80 millimeters at uh, 55 degrees. So this gives us an effective line of sight of uh, about 139.48 millimeters. As we come down, the lower plate is 60 mil thick. We have a 60 degree angle. So this gives us a line of sight of about 120 millimeters. As we know, this is our original plate that was uh, fitted to the vehicle. So this is uh, 50 mil thick at about 28 degrees. And this gives us an effective uh, line of sight of about 56 millimeters thick. From late November 44, there was discussion as well to actually mount the 128 millimeter Pac-80 gun. The vehicle was great regardless, but to have, a, again, a bigger gun uh, would have been a, a game changer. As we know, with guns, they have a recoil mechanism. There was discussions uh, sort of late 44 where they were looking at recoilless guns. So we have a gun in a fixed mount and they originally tried this with a Sturmgeschutz uh, with a 7.5 L48 gun where they had a fixed gun so it didn't recoil and from there the initial batch of 97 rounds that they fired it worked it worked great uh, they ended up firing over a thousand rounds out of this one vehicle the only issues that they found was the driver's periscope cracked uh, it sprung a leak in the uh, in the uh, radiator system and every time they fired, it would push the vehicle back a few centimetres. So with the limited numbers of Jag Panthers that were built and when they entered the war, you could sort of say that the combat effectiveness was hard to judge uh, because of the, the, the time frame that we were operating in. However, when they first come onto the battle scene, sort of that first notable engagement, sort of July 1944, where three of these come up against a squadron of Churchills, uh, were quite effective and knocked out 11 Churchills before they in fact had to uh, retreat. The 8.8 centimetre gun, you know, outstanding anti-tank gun uh, with the Pac-43. So for its time period, you know, you could actually call it, you know, sort of one of the best anti-tank platforms uh, probably in, in the later end of the war.